brothers, bootleggers, legends. That's not me writing that. That's the Taub family writing that, <laughs> to be quite truthful. Uh, nearly a century ago, Jacob and Abner Taub crafted and bootlegged their own whiskey during Prohibition to support the family. Then one fateful winter night in 1929, their world came crashing down during a sting that would land the brothers behind bars. Six long years later, Franklin Delano Roosevelt pardoned the Taub brothers. They were able to reignite their whiskey business with their brother Martin and help launch Baltimore Club Whiskey. This would set into motion a family tradition that would span generations. The brothers served their time, and now uh, the Taub family continues this legacy with the introduction of Jacob's Pardon, a fine American whiskey that pays homage to their rebellious roots. Dun, dun, dun. Gotta say hello to actually a lot of people. Mike is here. Ken, welcome to the show, man. Uh, Kevin is here. Hey, Kevin. No volleyball tonight, huh? Uh, Charles Mallory, he's the he's my composer who I got uh, turned into an alcoholic in uh, in South Carolina a couple years ago. Mike Euler, how's it going? Jeff Tishner, hey, this is great. So I wish I could tell you more about this bottle, um, but there's not a lot online about this particular blend. I will tell you what I know and what, what I've what I know I've written down because it was a hectic day. I was out of town for a little bit of it, and I had this much time to get ready. May I? Killer pot of jambalaya, though. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. A few years years ago, uh, there was a company from um, Baton Rouge that would come up and they would provide uh, like a party to people that they worked with in a local um, in a local corporation, and they would always bring food. Well, I got to know these guys really well, and I would work with them time after time after time. Even even the people in the corporation, they revolved out. I stayed with them. And uh, one time, one of the last times I got to see them, the wife of the owner of the company brought me this, I swear to you, a 22-pound Cajun and Creole cookbook. And that's what I made tonight's jambalaya out of. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. You have no idea. It's amazing. Uh, Therese is with us. Paul is with us. Hey, Paul, get the night off. I'm glad to see that. You may still be on vacation. Jealous. My own, uh, my own uh, strategic partner today looked at me and said, when we get done with this job next week, I expect you to take two weeks of vacation. I went, <laughs> I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. What's a vacation? <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's get this breathing. This is a higher proof, so I'm going with the uh, bourbon glass instead of a uh, Glencairn. Uh, this is aged eight years. This is the second recipe of the two. Let me delve into Jacob's Pardon and tell you a little bit about what I found out, which is not enough, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to do. Uh, Jacob's, Tau, the Tau brothers, they, they consider themselves rectifiers. Now, while most whiskey companies of today will quietly source something from somewhere else and just kind of keep it on the down low. Um, these folks don't. Back in the day when they were doing their own whiskey, their grandfather considered themselves rectifiers. What's a rectifier? Okay, you have a distiller. That's the Distilleries are the people who distill the spirits. They cook up the mash, they run the distillery, the grains are distilled into alcohol, then they barrel it. Okay. A rectifier does everything except for distill. So they have their own barrels, uh, they'll get their hooch from somewhere, maybe several somewheres, and uh, they'll mix them all together or whatever they're going to do, and then they barrel it in their own barrels with their own toast, their own char, whatever they want to do, and then they'll keep it in there for a while. That's what a rectifier does. That's what Jacob's Pardon does, and they're not outside the norm. They source their stuff from MGP, just like 133 other whiskey companies, okay? So, but the legend behind this brand is kind of interesting. It's the, the one story we know about somebody who got pardoned by FDR uh, after, uh, after uh, the prohibition fell. So, uh, let's get into some of this more. It said, uh, Mark Taub says, my grandfather called himself a rectifier. We're proud of that history. 
excited to be connected to it. Now, the first batch, Kevin, you probably won't like this. The first batch, Jacob's Pardon bought 56 barrels of 15-year-old light corn whiskey. Now, I just lost Kevin. Kevin's, ah, ah, ripping his clothes and gnashing his teeth. Ah, corn whiskey, ah. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. Um, uh, typically an indication it came from MGP ingredients. The mash bill on all of them was 99% corn. There's Kevin. Ah, rip, ah, scream, ah. 99% <laughs> corn and 1% malted barley. Uh, they fell in love with two of the barrels, number 23 and 37. They became the initial single barrel releases from the brand, bottled at cask strength in very limited qualities, quantities. <laughs> The other 54 barrels were blended with nine sourced barrels of eight-year-old Tennessee sour mash, okay, to create Jacob's Pardon's uh, small batch recipe number one. Blend number two is what we have here, and the origins of this were a little harder to find. I couldn't find any meaningful reviews on it. I couldn't find any meaningful mash bills. I did about a half hour's worth of searching. I should have spent a day on it. But I didn't, and here I am not knowing exactly what it went into this. Um, but I'm going to guess that the mash bill is going to be somewhat similar. However, I say this knowing that there is some advanced intelligence that comes to me, who of course possesses advanced intelligence, <laughs> that Jacob's Pardon, uh, the Taub brothers are, are not done experimenting. So there was recipe one, recipe two. They've got other things on the horizon. They do plan to revive the Baltimore Club whiskey. That's another thing. They want to do a barrel and bond. By the way, today is barreled and barrel and bonds B.I.B.'s birthday. It was on this day in history that uh, actually it was um, it was um, E.H. Taylor that put the work into creating the barrel and bond act. And why did he do that? Why did why did the consumer need protections from whiskey makers? Well, because people were making something that they called whiskey. Maybe it was some sort of grain alcohol, or maybe it wasn't. And then they would color that with everything from dirt to tobacco spit. No lie. And so the Bottled and Bond Act was the way for whiskey makers, real distillers, to protect you and me and others like us back in time from charlatans who would try to sell us something that we wouldn't want to drink. Hmm. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> kind of like Oak and Eden. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is blend number two. Um, they call this a Tennessee whiskey, and I can see why. They blended it with small nine, nine source barrels of eight-year-old Tennessee sour mash, but its original was from 15-year-old light corn whiskey. But that was blend number one. This is blend number two. There's no mash bill on the barrel or on the bottle. It does say that it's an eight-year age. It's got great color. Let's uh, get into it. If you hear these strange sounds, it's not me. I gave the dogs empty toilet paper rolls. Um, bigger dogs like paper towel rolls, but little dogs like mine like toilet paper rolls and they will chew on those things and play with them and rip them apart and leave pieces of it all over the floor and Chewy is down below me right now working on a toilet paper roll so you might hear that yes I'm talking about you all right wow okay okay all right I should have taken my time with that that was big nose <laughs> Whew. okay the corn leapt out. The ethanol leapt out. It went, Poof. that's what it did. Big old punch in the face. I'm going to go into this conflict with a little more diplomacy. Whew. I... I don't like saying this. It gives me no pleasure to tell you that it immediately conjures the image of turpentine, paint thinner. 
the nose is not a nose that intrigues me. Now there's some things going on. The corn is very heavy in it. I can feel, I can smell the corn and I can smell the ethanol. Okay. Yeah, that's turpentine. <laughs> that, that, is, that is not a good nose. What do they say about the nose? I wrote it down. Fragrances of di dry cereal, corn, and baking spice. Hi, Tyler. How's it going? Austin, how are you? Uh, yeah, so... Xylene, maybe. I used to, when I was in radio, the heads on the recorders, you know, that the tape goes across, you used to clean those heads with xylene. Oh, yeah, no. Okay, so the old factories are mellowing out now. I'm getting more of the corn. I want to say almost a grape wine. Not not Concord, but like a, a white wine like, that you make grapes. I kind of have that going on, but yeah, turpentine. <laughs> Sorry, paint thinner. All right, we're just gonna go into it. We're just well. Let me let me let me. <laughs> just... Now I'm not a huge fan of Tennessee whiskey. Um, of all of them, I've tried my favorite is the uh, Uncle Nearest 1884. And I finally got a hold of a couple bottles of that. Uh, very grateful for that. Um, other Tennessee whiskeys really haven't intrigued me too much. So with this one being a huge corn mash bill, we'll see if it's any different. I didn't even get to find out if it goes through the Lincoln County process. I would say that this bottle probably itself doesn't. But the Tennessee whiskey that they infused into this bottle probably did. Otherwise, it can't be called Tennessee whiskey. Thankfully, the palate was better than the nose, a lot. This is 109.3 proof. Comparatively, this drinks hotter than both the Larceny barrel proof we had and the Nulu single barrel barrel proof we had. The ethanol on this is hotter. It didn't dry out my mouth like the Nulu did, but it, is, it, it burns more along the sides of your tongue and a little towards the center. That bloom didn't bloom. It's set there. Uh, that was number one, though. Let's give it another shot. I have not tried Chattanooga yet, Kevin. It's on my list. Okay. I actually rather like this. Um, the nose is, the, no, the nose betrays the palate. The palate is actually quite nice. Um, it's got a smoothness to it, even though it's got a higher ethanol burn to it. Um, vanilla is a strong one. This does not, this does not remind me of either a corn whiskey or a Tennessee whiskey. It's got long legs with really some very flavorful legs here. I'm getting vanilla bean, like vanilla bean ice cream. Um, maybe uh, some graham cracker, some cheesecake type of feel. We'll just say vanilla bean cheesecake, okay. <laughs> What they say is uh, taste of cocoa butter, clove, mm, caramel, and baked honey ham. Deliciously assertive. I'll agree with the deliciously assertive. Um, this, is, this is a nice pour, actually. It's not in my top 20, but I like this. I'll drink it. I'll drink it again. 
I'll buy more. I like it. The corn whiskey is present. So if you're not a fan of corn whiskey, and mellow corn isn't the only corn whiskey out there. I pick on Kevin because we tried the mellow corn and he didn't like it. He brought me his bottle to finish, which I did. <laughs> um, but um, this is this definitely has hints of corn whiskey in it. Um, I'm not sensing anything that you would get out of a Tennessee whiskey at all. I'm not sensing the Lincoln County process. I'm not sensing some of the toasted cereals. I'm not sensing um, butterscotch. I get a, I'm getting a butterscotch note. That's that's the that's the legs is butterscotch, um, which you know is is a little bit like the vanilla bean, the cheesecake type of feel. It's that type of idea. Is the juice worth the juice, uh, Tyler? If you can get past the nose, which I didn't care for at all, I do like this. Um, now, after it's been open for a while, will the will the nose mellow out? It might. Um, I I think that the flavor of this is unique and flavorful. I like it. Um, some honey, um, definitely vanilla bean, uh, definitely butterscotch on the on the legs for sure, <laughs> for sure. And in time, <laughs> although I felt it that time in the back of my throat, in time, the ethanol burn on the tongue is lesser. It's still there, but it takes longer to get to you. And it's actually quite nice. For the, the, the palate on this and the mouthfeel, they're very, very balanced. Once you get past that first or second dram where the ethanol is kind of going, hey, oh, <laughs> I drink hot. Um, not nearly as hot as other ones I've had, don't get me wrong. Um, but this one, it, it's got a really nice sense of balance to it. I, And it's probably because it's an eight year. Uh, you know how I feel about the longer you age it, the more it's going to mellow out. Well, I feel that way about this one. Um, could it use another couple years? Yeah. I, I would be curious as to what would happen with it, with the nose, with the ethanol feel on the sides of the tongue, and with its proof. Because over time, the proof is going to go up, right? Because over, over that maturation period where it's in the barrel, it's gonna, the water is going to evaporate out, but the alcohol isn't. We established that last week. Um, so, But this is, I, I can't not recommend this. Um, Jacob's Pardon is very tasty, very good. Um, I don't know that it's won any awards. They put some effort into their bottle for sure. Um, it says uh, Baltimore Club, Jacob's Pardon. This is all raised lettering on the glass. Um, there's raised lettering down here by order of the president. <laughs> that's the pardon. <laughs> that's cool. Up here, uh, it says in 1933, President Roosevelt nullified Jacob Taub's conviction of bootlegging during Prohibition. That's where this story begins. Indeed. Again, this is uh, this is this is uh, recipe two. Um, it says 100% Tennessee whiskey. Well, if that's the case, then it's 100% Tennessee whiskey mixed with a corn whiskey that was also distilled in Tennessee. So, hard to say uh, until I get some more information on it. All right, I'm going to finish this up, and then we're going to do the water and ice test. I'm really not looking forward to the water and ice test this time, though. I tell you why. It's that good on the palate that I like it just the way it is. I can tell you I like it just the way it is. Very sweet at first. Almost a candy-ish 
type of flavor to it right at first, right on the tip of your tongue. Maybe some, I said, I've been saying this a lot lately, but it's been hitting me and that's bubble gum right on the tip of my tongue. And then it goes away as soon as it goes over the tip of my tongue. And I, that's that, you know, corn syrup is a lot of bubble gum, right? So no, there's no corn syrup in this, but this is a corn whiskey. All right. Uh, we'll stick with this glass. Oh, by the way, you may be curious about what I'm planning for Lent. Nothing. <laughs> uh, there are benefits to being Catholic. <laughs> or not Catholic. Not Catholic. Or not Catholic! Um, I'm not de de degrading any... De yeah, degrading anybody that is Catholic. Um, the truth of the matter is, though, I am going to be trying trying to keep my whiskey drinking to only two nights a week. Was that a half-hearted endorsement? Well, of Catholicism or of Lent or of the whiskey, Charles? I'm not sure which one you mean. Um, I'm not going to fully endorse the whiskey because the nose is not good, but the palate and the, and the, the finish, the legs, are really actually quite nice. So I won't endorse it, but I will say that if you happen upon it, it wouldn't be your worst purchase. I want to say this bottle's 50 bucks, something like that. I could be wrong. All right, we're just going to infuse some of that water. All right. I didn't knock it down much with water, but the, the, the ethanol in the nose is definitely, it's much better. Um, Less turpentine and more corn whiskey. There's still some of that there, though. It's just not good on the nose. It takes a little bit longer once you put a little water on it to get the flavors to you. Um, and then it just all kind of it's like, it's like, let's say that there's a fire hose and they've just turned it on and you get that little trickle at the front. And then all of a sudden, sploosh, you're covered in it. It's kind of like this. There's that trickle in the front and then all of a sudden, sploosh, you're covered in it. Um, that's kind of like it, what it is on water. It took a second to get to me. Let me give it another spin here. Spin class. Couldn't it? Couldn't it be like this, spin class? <laughs> okay. Here we go. Mike Dugan is watching. Hey, Duke. All right. We're doing uh, Jacob's Pardon. This is the recipe number two, which I wasn't able to find a lot of information on. Uh, but... Yeah, I mean, where before, neat, there was a flavor happening on the front of my tongue, the very tip. It would come across the tip of my tongue. That's why I always roll it in my mouth. You always hear me slurp because I'm rolling it. I want to make sure that it covers all of my tongue. And when I put it on water, the tip of my tongue was neglected, terribly neglected. It went straight for the center and the sides. And it gave me the flavor, but it took a second. Whereas when I had it neat, it started to activate itself right on the tip of my tongue and move itself back. There was a lot more layers of flavor. There was a lot more complexity without the water. So I'm going to tell you, if you go for Jacob's Pardon Recipe 2, unless you're a proof nerd and you don't like uh, higher proofs, I'd say leave it off water. You'll still get the flavors, but you'll get more out of it, I think, if you just leave it alone. Uh, but that's just me. And now just the inside of my lips are getting numb. All right, make sure we're not missing anything here. All right. So coming back to it, we're going to do the ice test. Decided not to cause a lot of, a lot of noise this time. You're welcome. All righty. 
probably a little bit bigger pour than I wanted, but that's all right. I want to give it a good test on this beautiful ice sphere. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, if you haven't gotten an ice sphere making kit, whether it's from Wintersmiths or wherever, you don't just you just don't know the joy of what it's like to dump a perfectly clear ice sphere in your bourbon or gin or vodka or anything else. I'm telling you, it's a special thing. <laughs> if I keep these annex up, we need more than just Teresa watching. I need, I need gaggles of ladies to come along and enjoy this bourbon tasting experience. That's what we need. We need to spread it out. Get your wives in involved. Get your girlfriends involved. Get your moms involved. Mine watches. <laughs> All right. Get this cooled down sufficiently. And the ice, the, the glass is starting to get cooled off, so I think it'll work. Okay. That was a different experience than the other two. That was just nice and pleasant. Has a nice mouthfeel to it. Um, cooled down nicely. Um, the flavors came out real well. Now I'm starting to finally get that toasted cereal. Uh, those, those strange Kentucky whiskey notes. Um, and there's something else. What is that? Still butterscotch. Just different. Like a more toffee-ish. Yeah. So before it was sweeter like a butterscotch, and now on ice, it's more got it's the, the legs are more toffee-like, which is completely fine. I like toffee. I like butterscotch. I feel like I'm <laughs> Margaret's listening. Hey, Margaret's with us. Hey, Margaret, how are you? Mike is sipping on a rare breed tonight. Ooh, so you're into the you're into the high proofs too. We've done we've done rare breed on the show. One of my favorite pictures I ever took was rare breed. The one I use tonight uh, is one I got from Jacob's Pardon uh, website. I'll I'll show that to you again just because I want to give them due. I think that's a great photo. It's a really nice photo. That is not the Jacob's Pardon we are drinking tonight. That's a 15 year. Uh, that's one of the other ones that they were working on. This is that first uh, batch that they did, the 56 barrels of the 15-year-old light corn whiskey. 99% um, corn, 1% malted barley. So that's what that one is. But I think it's a really neat photo, and I wish I had access right now to one of those whiskey barrels. I would use that. Oh, oh, oh. What I ever. Mm -hmm, hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kevin says he's drinking Jim Beam. Jim Beam what? The white label, 80 proof, which is fine. It's got a lot of flavor to it. I really like that one, actually. I didn't want to like that one. I didn't want to like it because Jim Beam is the number one distiller in the world. So <laughs> fight the power, right? <laughs> but I got to tell you, it was even the 80 proof is darn tasty. And, and we tasted that in the 81 proof wild turkey and the 80 proof or 80... six, I guess, so, uh, Evan Williams. And we went through the gamut of those beginning bourbons. And... Uh, Jim Beam is one I really enjoyed, actually. And the, and the 86 uh, proof um, Old Forester as well. That was stupid good for what it is. You know, bottom shelf. Oh, shoot. I had another one I was going to bring upstairs tonight. Ah, crud. Ah, poo. I'll do it next week. So I was at the liquor store. <laughs> Duh. And the um, guy behind the counter was telling me about the cheapest whiskey they have in the place. And I want to say it's called Kentucky Legend, but I'm not sure. But you can get a little one, like the little pint, for $3.50. I was looking at the whiskey Bible, and that guy scored it at 92%. Yeah, and it's only 80 proof. And I was going to bring it upstairs and try it tonight ahead of this, and I got, it was a hectic freaking day. 
just like yours was. I've got no excuses, but I forgot it. It's downstairs, and uh, I'm shucky darning myself right now. But we'll do it next week along with something else, and I haven't decided on that yet, uh, unless you guys have some suggestions. Jim Beam pre-prohibition style rye. Huh. I don't know if I've seen that one. I haven't looked for it, but I don't know if I've seen it. Let's get back to this. Yeah. I don't like it on water, but I like it neat, and I do like it on ice. Um, just adds a nice mouthfeel to it, brings the flavors together a little bit, calms that ethanol burn. It's got some nice flavor to it. I, I will tell you that if you see uh, Jacob's Pardon, you really ought to try to maybe pick it up. If you don't like it, I'll take it from you. <laughs> or somebody will like it. Uh, Kevin, if you want to give this a shot and you end up hating it, you know where you can deposit it. <laughs> I will help you dispose of it properly. Other than other that, you can uh, come on by and uh, and we'll taste it together. I'll let you, let you have some. Um, which, by the way, it's going to start to get warmer. We're not going to do it Super soon, this weekend is supposed to be up to like 60 degrees, but it's supposed to be rainy the whole time. Ick. Um, but it's going to start to warm up, and I'm going to start opening up invitations to people who want to come and join me on a Friday night for a bonfire or fire pit on the porch and some drinking and some storytelling and who knows what else we'll get ourselves into. Uh, that'll be coming up as we get into the spring and things start to warm up. We'll start fires back there and, and uh, just have a good old time getting to know each other. Um, but that was Jacob's Pardon. That's recipe number two. Really good neat. Uh, the nose is nasty. <laughs> nasty. Um, on ice, it's actually quite good. Um, so this was a surprising one. I, I, I've never had anything like this before. It's unusual. It's unique. And that by its very virtue is something that you ought to at least try. Go to a bar and try it. Pick it up and try it. Uh, go to a friend's house and try it. Um, I'll pour this for you. Uh, in the meantime, uh, again, we're going to go back to that uh, 80 proof one that I talked about that I forgot to bring upstairs, and uh, we'll pick out something else to try next week. I'm leaning towards, oh, I forget the name of it now. Gosh, darn it. Bernheim. I'm leaning towards the Bernheim. I picked that one up. We could do that one. Uh, there's a rye I picked up that I'm curious about, really curious about. Um... So, I don't know. I don't know. We'll pick something. Uh, I'll let you know early in the week so you can get the time to go out and get it. Um, I don't know what it's going to be yet. I know, I know there's got to be something out in the basement that I've been going, oh, I should have had that a long time ago. This was one of those. I bought this a couple of months ago, and this is the first I've actually opened it. So, uh, let's make sure I'm not missing anything. Eagle Rare, Charles, you stud. Pardon is 89. Oh, okay. Thank you, Teresa. There was there was another one that I was telling somebody about that was forty nine ninety nine, and it was today. And I thought it was this, but it must have been something else. I don't remember what it was, but you're right. This is a little bit more of a pricey bottle. Um, is it worth it? I don't know. That's. Uh, I think if it were fifty nine ninety nine, yes. Anything below that, yes. Um, above that, you're getting into territory that it may be outpricing its value. But again, it's a, it's unique. It's interesting. Uh, I like the flavor of it. It's neater on ice. I, I like it. I'm going to have a little bit more of it before I go to bed tonight. Um, but yeah, you could do worse. I've had worse. You've seen it. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Teresa, for the uh, clarification on that. I do appreciate it. Uh, you're doing EHT single barrel, you lucky thing. Thanks for the invite. <laughs> uh, oh, you want me to do the Bernheim? Because you're going to be doing the Heaven Hill experience in May, and when you're done, you can do a cask strength of Bernheim port in your own bottle. All right. Bernheim it is. Next week, I'll be doing the Bernheim. Okay? Okay. Because Kevin asked, so I will follow through with that. Uh, let's see. Austin, you're back to the uh, Michter's American with a New York Strip Medium Rare. I salute you, sir. <laughs> I salute you. That sounds fantastic. 
That sounds really stupid good. Those two would go so well together. Oh my gosh, you got a great pairing. Fantastic. Nice job. I love it. I love it. This is fun. This is fun. I can't wait to get you guys more involved and pull you into it. I think it would be just ridiculously fun to have you all here. Uh, whether we're doing this online or just getting together for a party, I think that would be so much fun to get to know each other and eat and drink and be stupid. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Do continue to spread the word. We're continuing to grow. We're real close to 300 followers now if we haven't actually hit it. I haven't looked at it in like a couple days. We were at 299 if I remember right. So um, keep getting the word out. If you're having a good time, I you know I'm having a good time. because Maybe not E.H. Taylor single barrel good time, but <laughs> or Eagle Rare good time. Uh, but it's or 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 rare breed good time. Ooh, although this is pretty close, it's 109 proof. It's good. It's good. Thank you again. Thank you again. This is so much fun. I look forward to doing the Bernheim next week, uh, so Kevin can have his curiosity sub 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 uh, taken care of. <laughs> and then uh, we will. Uh, I'll bring up that other one too. That that cheapy that's supposed to do so well. That 92 uh, stars or whatever. A 92% on the grading scale with the Whiskey Bible. I will bring that upstairs next week, too. So uh, in the meantime, you guys have a great week. Uh, take it easy. I hope you have a great weekend. If it's not raining where you are, enjoy the uh, heat wave. Um, I will be doing what I can to enjoy the weekend as well. So take care of yourselves, and we will see you again next Thursday. Thanks again. This is fun.